Hello, everyone. Welcome. OK, now I have lost my glasses. So here we go. <laughs> I, th I know. That might be too far. So bear with me. <laughs> well, yes. Well, what strength are those? <laughs> Thank goodness for friends. Susan's a friend. Okay, this is better. Chris Sabeck joined the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum in 1998 as an intern. Since that time, he has also acted as an archaeological diver, conservation lab director, and the director of research in archaeology. In November of 2023, Chris became the executive director of the organization. He earned a BA in history and anthropology from Ball State University. Letterman win? It is. <laughs> yes. Well, I thought you were. <laughs> Second to you. And an MA from the Nautica, Nautical Archaeology Program at Texas A&M University. Chris has more than 25 years of experience leading the archaeological examination of underwater sites related to the military and commercial history of the Northeastern United States and Canada. I know we're in for a treat. Please welcome Chris Sabick. Thank you, everyone. I uh, appreciate that very much. And thank you for the introduction. That was fantastic. Um, I'm here to talk with you today about uh, the history of Lake Champlain. And, you know, I, I tend to to title my, my basic history presentation about the lake as the highway to history, because that's really what it was. It's, uh, you know, this water corridor through the wilderness, uh, certainly in the 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, really was the only way to move men and material and trade goods through this area uh, effectively and efficiently. So let's, uh, let's dive right in here. Um, so, of course, we're talking about the history of Lake Champlain. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, but uh, Lake Champlain is about 122 miles long. It's about 12 miles wide at its widest point. Um, it empties to the north through the Richelieu River, which then drains into the St. Lawrence. Um, and at its southern end, um, at the town of Whitehall, New York, it's, you know, it's about 40 miles from the headwaters of the Hudson River. So it was a combination of all these waterways that really formed this highway to history, as we like to term. Um, and it was control of this corridor, this transportation route through the wilderness, that really made Lake Champlain such a vital piece of geography uh, during the military part of the lake's history, as, and then ultimately the commercial and trade part of its history as well. Um, you know, there are rapids in the Richelieu River, so you can't take a boat from Lake Champlain to the St. Lawrence directly at this time. And obviously you have that little overland route from the southern end of Lake George or the southern end of Lake Champlain to the headwaters of the Hudson. Um, that made it a little more difficult, but despite those obstacles, this was still certainly the most efficient way to move large amounts of men and material through the area. Uh, which was otherwise, you know, a fairly trackless wilderness, certainly in the 18th century. Um, we tend to break the history uh, of the lake down into four principal eras. The first, and by far the longest, is the Native American occupation of the Champlain Valley. Um, and then we have the military history uh, of, the, uh, of the lake, and commercial history, and where we are today in the recreational period of the lake's uh, history. I would like to think that we're starting on a fifth era here, and that would be an era of conservation. Uh, conservation not only of the, the beautiful lake and its natural resources, but also of its cultural resources. And for me, that means the shipwrecks and the other submerged uh, sites in Lake Champlain. You know, there's a lot of effort right now going into water quality and cleaning up Lake Champlain and into preserving its natural resources and its cultural resources. So I'm gonna have to add a new bullet to this slide. I guess it's up to me to decide when. Uh, I, think, I think we're there. I think we're there. Um, so starting with the, the first period, the Native American period of the lake's history is by far the longest, right? We have Native American populations moving into the Champlain Valley at least 12,000 years ago, if not longer. Uh, 
Um, and they utilized Lake Champlain for the same reasons that Europeans would later when they came in. It was a transportation corridor. It was often a boundary between, uh, between tribal entities. Of course, it was uh, a source of uh, natural resources for food and other um, uh, resource management that they had to do. Um, it was a trade network. It fulfilled all these same uh, roles that it would later in the lake's history as well. Sadly, it is the portion of the lake's history that we have the least archaeological evidence for that comes from the lake itself anyway. Uh, there's obviously a, an extensive amount of archaeology that's been done around the lake and around its tributaries uh, on Native American sites, even stretching back as far as 12,000 years, but we find very little Native American material in the lake itself up to this point. It doesn't mean it's not there, means we don't really know how to find it yet. Um, or at least we haven't put the effort into trying to find it. And if, uh, if that's something that you, any of you know somebody that's really interested in doing, have them contact me because uh, I'd like to talk with them about how we should go about doing this. Um, in these pictures here, um, obviously we have uh, Native American uh, hunting, uh, spear fishing from a birch bark canoe. Um, we have this uh, dugout wooden canoe on the right here, which is actually not from Lake Champlain, that's from Shelburne Pond, but it gives you an idea of the type of watercraft that they were using um, on these waterways uh, around the area. Undoubtedly, there must be some remnants of dugout canoes in Lake Champlain. Just haven't found them yet. And the only uh, Native American artifact that I've had personal contact with that was certainly found in the lake is this small pot that's pictured down here at the bottom. And it looks much bigger than it actually was in this image. It, it's about the size of half a coconut. It's this tiny little vessel. But it's one of only four known examples of this pottery style uh, that's intact, that have been found. And the story of how this came uh, to the Maritime Museum initially was, was quite dramatic. Uh, some divers were diving off of Thompson's Point, you know, kind of in the deepest part of the lake's uh, depths, and they, they found this small pot, and they were curious about it. They just threw it in the back of their pickup truck, and they came driving down to the museum. It was apparently rolling around in the bed of the truck, <laughs> and, uh, you know, when the archae this was before my time, but when the archaeologists, you know, they got obviously really excited and really interested in it, and it's one of those things that if it was still in the lake today, you never would have found it because it would be covered with zebra mussels just like everything else on the bottom of Lake Champlain is these days. So it would have just looked like another rock or log or whatever underwater with covered in mussels. So it was a very uh, opportune time for this thing to be discovered. Um, the stylis stylistically, uh, you can date this pot to about 1800 years ago. So. It's quite old, and as I mentioned, it's a, a very rare example of this type of pottery. Um, it has now been transferred to the Chimney Point Historic Site where they have it in storage uh, at their location. But we trans transition into the military history of the lake um, pretty much immediately with the arrival of Europeans. Uh, you know, Samuel de Champlain, when he arrives in 1609, literally inserts himself into a conflict that was happening between uh, rival tribes along Lake Champlain and uh, uses his, you know, European firearms to have to have a uh, dramatic result in this little conflict that's happening at the time of his arrival. So this is not to say that there wasn't conflict happening between tribal entities prior to the arrival of Europeans, but uh, Europeans quickly realized the importance of this water corridor and of the immense natural resources of the Champlain Valley. So pretty quickly you have this, the establishment of fortifications along the length of um, the Hudson, uh, Lake George, Lake Champlain, and the Richelieu River to try to control this corridor and the trade associated with it, which at this time was mostly the fur trade, of course. Um, you know, the, you have the establishment of, uh, well, what, was, what is now known as Fort Ticonderoga, then when the French built it, would have been Fort Carrion, uh, as well as the fortifications at Crown Point, which was, when the French built their small fort there, it was Fort St. Frederick, later replaced by a much larger British fortification that you can still see today. Very impressive if you haven't been down there to see it. It's quite huge. That's the one that's directly on the other side of the Champlain Bridge. 
Um, the military period included all of the colonial wars. They almost all have at least some naval component that happened around Lake Champlain. And we have evidence of uh, these activities, at least from the French and Indian War. Um, there's a number of shipwreck sites down near Fort Ticonderoga that date to the French and Indian War, so this, to the 1750s, which are some of the oldest inland shipwrecks uh, in North America. Um, the military period really comes to an end after the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay during the War of 1812. Um, but let's talk about the role that Lake Champlain played in the American Revolution really quickly. Um, these are our three main uh, areas of interest. Uh, Fort St. John at the very northern end, Fort Ticonderoga, and what was known then as Skeensboro at the very southern end of the lake. That's Whitehall, New York today. Right? In, seven, in the, the fall and winter of 1775, uh, American colonial forces actually invaded Canada, captured Montreal, and moved on to try to capture Quebec City during the winter of 1775, um, using this water corridor as one of their avenues of attack into Canada. Um, that attack on Quebec City ended badly for the American forces. Uh, they weren't able to capture uh, the citadel at Quebec um, before uh, a bunch of British reinforcements arrived from the continent. And the American forces were forced to retreat up, up the St. Lawrence and ultimately up Lake Champlain to Fort Ticonderoga and uh, Skeensboro, where they started to build a fleet of ships. Um, and the British were kind of hot on their heels, and they settled at the northern end of the lake at Fort St. Jean, and they also started to build a fleet there to contest control of Lake Champlain because it was this important uh, transportation corridor. So over the summer of 1776, the Americans built a fleet of about 15 vessels, um, which consisted of eight um, what were called gundalos or gunboats, this is the gunboat Philadelphia, is an example of this that we have a replica of at the museum and is in the Smithsonian uh, in Washington, D.C. Also included three row galleys, which were larger, um, more powerful, better sailing uh, vessels than the gunboats. That's what's being built there in the, on the back left of the upper image. Much larger, and you can see the gunboats quite a bit smaller in the front. Those gunboats are about 54 feet long and 15 feet wide carry just three guns. The uh, row galley is more like 74 feet long and 20 feet wide and carries 10 guns. The, the gunboats, all three of the guns that they carried were all pointed in a different direction. So they weren't actually the most effective fighting vessels. <laughs> the row galleys have a more traditional broadside like you would have uh, a, with other naval fighting vessels at this time. Uh, and in addition to those, uh, let's see, 11 vessels, they had four smaller sailing schooners that they had captured earlier in 1775 that they incorporated to, into the fleet as well, like the one in the center of our bottom image there, which is the Royal Savage, um, which until the row galleys were completed, acted as Benedict Arnold's flagship for the American fleet. I should mention that Benedict Arnold was in charge of the American fleet on Lake Champlain at this time. So while the Americans were building their fleet, the, the uh, English were building their fleet, the British were building their fleet up at Fort St. John, um, they had better resources and better sailors that they were able to bring to the, to the fort uh, and they can, were able to construct a much more powerful fleet. They actually disassembled some of their vessels where they, they took from the, that were already in the St. Lawrence fleet. They took all the upper works off of those boats and they were able to drag some of them up the falls uh, the, through the rapids in the Richelieu River to get them to Fort St. John, and then they rebuilt them. Uh, they had some of their gunboats. They also had uh, a whole cluster of gunboats in their fleet, though they opted just to have one gun, and it just pointed out the front of the boat. Anyway, they, those were sent over as kits. They had been already constructed in England. They'd been disassembled and all the parts numbered, and they sent them over here as like a little model pack, and they just were able to preassemble them pretty quickly. So those two fleets finally met in combat in October of 1776 at the Battle of Valcour Island. Um, if you're not familiar with Valcour Island, it's just a little bit south of Plattsburgh, New York. And Benedict Arnold shows a really interesting position for his fleet 
uh, between Valcor Island and the New York shore. So that's them uh, on the upper part of this image, tucked in behind Valcor Island. And this was a clever position because he knew that the British, who were coming from down from St. John, they would only be able to, you know, to leave St. John with a wind out of the north that would carry them up the lake. And in this case, with this position, they actually had to sail past Valcour Island and then try to swing around and come up into the wind to come to grips with the American fleet. And a lot of the larger vessels in the British fleet just couldn't do that. Um, and that's why you see them kind of down here in the foreground where they didn't actually participate to any great extent in the battle. The majority of the fighting on the British side was conducted by the gunboats, which you can see in a line here shown stretching from shore to shore. That's, a, that's probably a bit of an exaggeration. And a couple of their um, better sailing schooners were also able to come up into the wind. But the, the largest, most powerful vessels from the British fleet were not able to engage in any significant way uh, for most of this conflict. The fighting on October 11th of 1776 started about 11 o'clock in the morning and lasted until nightfall. Um, and the American forces, uh, when night fell, they, were, uh, they found themselves very short on ammunition and short on gunpowder and trapped, right? They were now trapped in this little pocket that they had created behind Valcour Island. The British settled back and created a blockade from the southern tip of Valcour over to the New York shore you know, in an effort to keep the Americans penned in there so that they could finish them off the following morning. But in a, quite an incredible feat of bravery, the, uh, the American fleet decided that they had to escape. They had to find a way to sneak through this blockade and flee south on the lake, hoping to get to Crown Point and Fort Ticonderoga. So they actually hung a lantern in the back of each vessel that was shrouded on three sides, so it could only be seen from directly astern. And the boats lined themselves all up single file using those lights as guides. And then with muffled oars and in strict, uh, you know, absolute si orders of silence, they were able to find a path along the New York shore through the British fleet and escape south. Now, they may have been greatly aided by the burning of the Royal Savage, right? This vessel that had been the American flagship early in the battle, it had run up onto the southern tip of Valcour Island. Uh, you can see it here, right there, stuck on the island. And the British took the opportunity in the evening to burn that vessel so that the Americans wouldn't try to reoccupy it and put it back into the fight. I'm sure that proved to be a, a fantastic distraction for all, all the poor, tired British sailors who were supposed to be manning this, you know, this picket line. Probably were gravitating, their eyes gravitating towards this giant fire that was happening on the southern tip of Valcour Island. We also have to remember that the majority of these sailors were probably functionally deaf at this point. After cannon firing for, you know, 10 hours or eight, eight hours during the course of the day, there's, these weapons are incredibly loud if you're standing near them. I'm sure that uh, both of those factors, you know, worked in the Americans' favor and allowed them to escape. Um, the American fleet fled south. They stopped briefly near Schuyler Island to patch holes and to fix rigging. They carried on through the day uh, of October 12th. The British, realizing that their quarry had escaped, set off in pursuit of them. And ultimately, Arnold, realizing that he was going to lose the fleet because the British were catching up with them, he drove the American fleet, or what was left of it, into um, what we now call Arnold's Bay. At the time, it was Ferris's Bay. There he, he burned his, his remaining vessels and the crew members escaped onto shore and overland down to Fort Ticonderoga. So that's the kind of broad brush history, but let's talk about what archaeological evidence we have of this. And I'm only going to talk about a couple of things because there is actually an extraordinary amount of archaeological evidence from this three-day battle uh, from October 11th to October 13th in 1776. And probably the most famous piece of that uh, archaeological evidence is uh, the remains of the gunboat Philadelphia, which sank at Valcour Island. Um, after the fighting had started to slow down, um, the boat, which had been hit by a 24-pound cannonball right in the bow of the vessel, stove in a number of planks there. You know, and a 24-pound cannonball is a good-sized hunk of iron. Um, 
have some, some friends who are working on this boat, which is now in the Smithsonian, and they say you can see this, the path that this ball took from one side of the boat to the other, where it just, you know, just shredded all the wooden components of the boat on its way through. So it was going down, and uh, luckily they were able to, most of the crew was able to escape onto one of these larger row galleys that you see in the background here, this one being the row galley Washington. Um, so that boat sank uh, there at Valcour Island, and it was rediscovered in 1935 by a gentleman named Lorenzo Hagland, who was a retired U.S. Navy diver and had started his, his own kind of salvage corporation uh, and, and did a lot of uh, boat recoveries throughout the Northeast. He was vacationing on Lake Champlain, became uh, infatuated by the history of Lake Champlain and the number of Revolutionary War battles and, and shipwrecks that were in the lake, and he set about to try to find some of these wrecks. In 1934, he recovered the remains of the Royal Savage, that boat that had burned on the southern tip of the lake. And with the success of that, he set about trying to find the Philadelphia. And in 1935, he was able to locate the Philadelphia and raise it. And you can see here, as it broke the surface, that the, the vessel is, is basically intact. Uh, all its guns were still on board. There was a big artifact collection still inside. The mast is still standing. The top mast and some of the rigging is missing, but other than that, pretty much all of the pieces were there. That boat toured around as an attraction uh, for 25-ish years. And ultimately, upon Hagland's death, it was accepted into the National Museum of American History, run by the Smithsonian Institution in D.C., and it's still on display there now. Uh, here's a picture of it in the galley up on the upper right. The, that boat is actually in preparation for 2026, which is the 250th anniversary of all this stuff. Um, the Smithsonian is having uh, the vessel reconserved Reanalyzed. They're doing a lot of really interesting and amazing work around it uh, as we speak. So you may be hearing more about the Philadelphia as we go forward. Um, when it was uh, accepted into the Smithsonian, they carried out an extremely detailed documentation of the shipwreck and its construction, the ship and its construction. And we at the Maritime Museum utilized that set of plans to create a replica of this boat, a full size functional replica of the. Philadelphia, called the Philadelphia II, which you can see under construction here and under sail there uh, to the left of it. That boat was launched in 1991. So at this point, we still have the boat, not on the water anymore. She, uh, she actually sank during the pandemic, um, at, during the winter, and we had it raised and the insurance company said, you know, you probably really should. We're not going to, basically, they said, we're not going to insure that again if you put it back on the water. So it's sitting on the lawn at the museum now. Um, you know, that many years for a wooden watercraft is pretty exceptional to begin with. So we're, we're happy with what we've got out of the Philadelphia, too. And it's still a great teaching tool, uh, even though it's on the hard now. Um, we also have the remains of the gunboat Spitfire. So again, as they retreated south from Valcor on the night of October 11th into the 12th, they had to abandon two more gunboats um, in the vicinity of Schuyler Island. One of those was the gunboat Jersey, and the other was the Spitfire. They attempted to sink both of these watercraft, and they were successful with the, uh, with the Spitfire, which sank into deep water. Uh, they were less successful with the Jersey, which the British found the next morning swamped, but still floating at the water surface, and they were able to recover that vessel and incorporate it into their fleet, which is exactly what the Americans didn't want and why they sunk the Philadelphia and ultimately burned their other vessels. Right? This was a big thing in 18th century naval warfare. If you can capture your enemy's vessel instead of destroying it, then you can incorporate it into your own fleet and make your own fleet stronger. Spitfire sank into deep water, and it was not seen again until 1997, when it was rediscovered during a lake-wide sonar survey that the Maritime Museum carried out in collaboration with Middlebury College. Uh, Middlebury College Geology Department was really interested in collecting, you know, detailed uh, imagery of the bottom of the lake for geological studies, and we piggybacked our study onto theirs, and we're obviously interested in the cultural resources that were identified during this process, and one of those was the gunboat Spitfire. The boat still sits today in deep water. 
And what you're looking at now is a three-dimensional model of this uh, wreck that was just created back in the summer of 2022. Using a process called photogrammetry, um, we collected 30,000 photographs of this wreck from every conceivable angle. And using uh, new computer software, you can stitch all those images together and create this fantastic three-dimensional model that shows um, the site as it existed at that time. So now we're hoping to use this model for future planning on what we're going to do with the Spitfire. Uh, the vessel still technically belongs, well, not even technically, it belongs to the U.S. Navy, right? Uh, any vessel that's sunk flying a national flag um, remains the property of that government in perpetuity, so this still belongs to the U.S. Navy. Um, even though technically the U.S. Navy didn't exist at that, but that's, <laughs> that's beside the point. Um, so everything, right, we're, we're developing some management plans and priorities for this vessel, but anything that we propose to do will have to go through the Navy, get their approval, and hopefully their participation, because um, they certainly have resource, access to resources that we don't at the Maritime Museum. But the, you can see, again, the vessel is virtually intact. Um, it only has one gun still present, the one in the bow. The two guns that would have been pointing out to either side, the, the waist guns, are missing and were presumably dumped overboard as they retreated south in an effort to keep the boat afloat as long as possible. And certainly something that we hope to, to locate in the future if possible. Uh, but really a remarkable wreck and we're, we're starting to create an advisory council uh, of other cultural organizations and archaeological professionals and technical divers to think about how to, uh, you know, what kind of research design, what kind of research questions do we want to ask about this wreck and what kind of methodologies would we use to excavate it, document it, recover artifacts from it, uh, you know, hopefully it to coincide with the 2026 uh, anniversary of all these actions taking place. So hopefully more to come on that as well. Um, evidence of the War of 1812 in Lake Champlain is also pretty extensive. Um, you know, when the war broke out in 1812, um, Americans found themselves with only just a few gunboats on Lake Champlain that were still left. The entire Revolutionary War fleet was gone. And so all that was left was they had a couple of gunboats um, that were used for basically revenue purposes, right? Customs control kind of situation on the lake. So they realized very quickly that once again, this water highway was going to be used as an invasion route. So got to build a new fleet. So they sent this gentleman who seems to have an incredibly long neck. I'm not sure what's <laughs> going on with this image. But they, uh, his name is Thomas McDonough, and he was uh, promoted to Commodore, sent to Lake Champlain, and told to build a fleet. He found an existing shipyard uh, below the falls on Otter Creek in Virgins. He took over that, uh, that shipyard and began building an American fleet there. And guess what? Once again, the British at Fort St. John started building their fleet there. History repeats itself, even though it's just a few years later. Um, the position below the falls in Virgins was certainly uh, a wise choice because the falls, uh, you know, powered several sawmills, ironworks, all of those things you need to build a fleet of vessels very quickly uh, in, in the wilderness. And those two fleets once again met in, uh, in combat on September 11th of 1814 at the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay. So frankly, just a little bit north of Valcor, where the previous battle had taken place. Um, and quite interestingly, uh, McDonough chose a position not unlike Arnold's at Valcor. He hid behind Cumberland Head and anchored all his ships in a line and forced the British to sail around Cumberland Head and up into the wind to come to grips with them. And his boats were, as I mentioned, anchored, held in position, and as the British came in, they were just able to, you know, blast them apart with, uh, with broadsides as they came in. And as their vessels started to get damaged on one side, with using the series of anchors they had out, they could actually pivot the boat 180 degrees, and now you've got a fresh broadside of cannon that you could start to fire at. In hopes of stopping the British from doing exactly the same thing, American gunners actually targeted the anchors on the incoming British fleet. 
And at least one of them was shot off and relocated in 2001. And that's this enormous anchor that's here at the bottom, which was shot off of the British flagship, the Confiance, which is the largest sailing ship to ever operate on Lake Champlain. Uh, the anchor, this anchor is about 14 feet from tip to tail, and the, the wooden cross piece is also about 14 feet long. In total weight is 3,200 pounds. Um, this anchor has uh, a number of cannonball dents in it. Um, and quite remarkably on the, the flukes or the palms of that anchor, um, the weight of the anchor is, is painted on there and that paint survives. And on the other one it says the word Quebec because this anchor was constructed in England and then shipped to Quebec and ultimately on to Lake Champlain. Uh, and so it was, had a shipping label on it, which is extremely cool. <laughs> And you can see the preservation here is rather exceptional, particularly for the part that was buried in the mud. There's not even any rust on this metal, as opposed to the part that was sticking up out of the mud uh, has you know, kind of thick, chunky rust on it. But the, the thick calcium-based clay that we have at the bottom of Lake Champlain forms an anaerobic environment. So there's no oxygen there. The preservation even of things like iron is exceptional when it's buried in the bottom of Lake Champlain. Now, uh, the Americans were a little more successful <laughs> at the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay uh, and were able to defeat the British fleet and capture their, uh, all of their vessels. Um, I don't have a slide of it, but after, as the war started to wind down, the Americans took the remains of both fleets, the American and the British fleet, all the way down to Whitehall, and they laid them up in ordinary, or what we might call mothballing today. And uh, there are remains of several of those shipwrecks still in the Pulteney River at the very southern end of Lake Champlain. Um, you know, and it was after the War of 1812 where we really transitioned into the, uh, into the commercial period of the lake's history. And that's not to say that there wasn't any commercial traffic before or during the, those pre previous conflicts, but that's really became the focus after the War of 1812. Uh, we had a number of sailing ferries and sailing vessels that operated on Lake Champlain, uh, as well as Lake Champlain was an extremely early adopter of steam technology. In fact, the second, the world's second successful uh, steamboat was on Lake Champlain. There was a, a steamboat on Lake Champlain in 1809. So before the War of 1812, there was a, a functional steamboat, the Vermont, um, pictured here at Basin Harbor uh, in this Ernie Haas painting. Um, and in fact, that shipyard that McDonough took over in Virgins was in the process of building another steamboat on Lake Champlain when he stepped in and, and took over the shipyard. So there was the possibility that we could have had the first steam-powered warship in the world, uh, but McDonough realized that, well, first of all, steam technology to an, an old sailor was, uh, was anathema, I think. And also, you know, one cannonball to the boiler and this whole thing would have blown up. So anyway, they converted that hull into a sailing ship and that became the Ticonderoga, um, which there are remains of the Ticonderoga still on display in Whitehall, uh, if you're passing through there. It's a very sad sight, unfortunately, because it's just rotting away, but there, there's still some there. Anyway, I digress. Um, we also have the adoption of some really interesting technologies on Lake Champlain, like horse-powered ferry boats. One thing that happened when steam technology moved into the area is that people got used to things running on a schedule, right? You could actually schedule when a boat was gonna arrive and when it was gonna make its next stop. That had never been the case before, right? If you were on a sail ferry, if the wind was blowing the wrong way, you just didn't leave that day. You waited until the wind was in the appropriate direction before you went someplace. So the idea that you could schedule things uh, became understandably popular. So one adaptation to this new reality was the creation of these horse-powered ferry boats. Not everyone could afford the extremely expensive uh, steam engines and the specialists that were needed to maintain and run those steam engines. So they created this horse-powered alternative. And we, uh, uh, one of these types of horse boats was located in Burlington Harbor uh, in the late 70s or early 1980s, which this bottom image is, I know it's hard to decipher what that is, but that's a photo mosaic of this wreck right after it was first um, identified in the 1980s. Uh, 
And it has, uh, you know, one of the first things you notice is it's got these, it's got paddle wheels on either side. So the initial thoughts were like, oh, this is a cute little steamboat. This is really interesting. But you start looking inside of it and there's no machinery. There's no boilers, there's no engines. There's not even any place for them to be. But what you do find is under the deck, there is this huge turntable that you see drawn out here. And that's, you can see some spokes of it coming out here underneath this deck planking. There are two holes cut out on either side of that deck that allowed access to that turntable. The horses would stand on the turntable and as they walked, they turned this huge turntable, sent power through the drive shaft back to a set of bevel gears that then transferred the power out to the paddle wheels and they could turn it. They actually had the ability to shift this boat into reverse without having to turn the horses around. So <laughs> that's pretty handy. Um, and what we see on the left there is, is the ultimate evolution of this technology where the horses actually stood on a treadmill. Um, and they turned a treadmill that was connected by belts to the paddle wheels and then that turned the paddle wheels. But um, this is the only known example of a horse powered ferry boat that's found in Lake Champlain. Um, and the fact that it was found in Burlington is kind of odd because as these were horse powered, uh, they weren't able to, to do really long crossings. The horses would just get exhausted. So there's no way it was actually operating in, from Burlington. Uh, you know, that's, that's where the lake is the widest. So probably it had operated in uh, a narrower portion of the lake and had just been brought to Burlington for repairs. And when they decided it just wasn't worth fixing, it was sunk intentionally, is our, is our hypothesis. But we do have historical documentation of horse-powered ferry boats operating from Basin Harbor uh, over to Westport, which is, you know, a little over a mile. That's a much more reasonable distance for horses. But a really cool, interesting uh, adaptation of technology there. Um, and it wasn't until 1823 that we have the establishment of the Champlain Canal that, that the commercial era really blossomed. Right, uh, 1823, we have the construction of the canal stretching from Whitehall, uh, New York, to Waterford, New York, on the headwaters of the Hudson River. And now suddenly you could take a vessel that you loaded with goods in Plattsburgh or in Burlington, and you could take it all the way to New York City without ever having to transload your shipment. This reduced the cost of shipping by 90%. What had normally cost $10 a ton to ship from Burlington to New York City now cost $1. Um, and as you can imagine, that created a, a huge economic boom in the area. Suddenly, there were hundreds of canal boats being built, and you had massive natural resource extraction from the Champlain Valley uh, into these canal boats that were then sent down to New York City and ultimately also connected to the Erie Canal and could go out west. Um, and they would come back with manufactured goods and other products that you couldn't manufacture in the Champlain Valley itself. Um, you know, the majority of these canal boats were totally unpowered. They were hauled through the canal system by horses or mules. And then when they got to the open water of Lake Champlain or down onto the, the big waters of the Hudson, they would raft up into these huge long chains of boats and be dragged uh, with, a, with a, a tugboat or a steam, in early years, just a, an old steamboat that was put into, as a t used as a towboat to tow them up the lake to, uh, to their final destination. Um, and like I said, there were hundreds of them. This is an image of the opening of the canal um, in the spring in Whitehall, New York. And this is all the boats lining up to go, uh, to go, go up the lake. You can see there's just dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Um, they were typically kind of owner operated. Um, and I like to think of these boats as the tractor trailers of their days, right? This is the semi trucks of their days. The, the, usually a family unit operated the boat and they lived in that small stern cabin at the aft end of the boat, which is maybe a 12 by 12 space <laughs> where your entire family lives. The rest of the boat is, you know, it's a cargo hold. Um, so it, uh, I'm sure it was a very sparse life, but, um, uh, we had thousands of people that were involved in the canal operations and had a very unique and distinct culture, uh, which examining these canal boat shipwrecks has really revealed to us. It's been quite fascinating. 
And on Lake Champlain, we had a rather unique uh, evolution of the canal boat in that we had sailing canal boats. Uh, these were obviously different from the unpowered traditional canal boats in that they carried folding sails, uh, folding masts uh, and sails with them. So when they got to the lake, they could put their masts up, set their sails and sail to port, and they didn't have to wait sometimes days or even a week or more for these long toes to be arranged. And they could get to port sooner. And obviously, if you get to, get to market with your goods sooner, you're going to get the best price for them, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a very effective technique. And uh, these continued in operation into the late 19th century when there started to be enough tow boats uh, that you just didn't need, you know, it didn't take as long to form those, those rafts of boats up and you didn't really need the sailing rig, which did take up space inside the boat that could be used for cargo. But we have ample evidence of sunken canal boats in Lake Champlain. And one of my uh, favorite stories and one of my favorite wrecks to dive is actually uh, the General Butler, which is pictured down here on the bottom. The General Butler was a 1862 class sailing canal boat that was uh, in December of 1876. It was making, trying to make one more journey with a load of cut stone to Burlington. Um, the captain at the time, Captain Montgomery, uh, had himself and his crew. He also had his daughter and some of her friends on board who were going into Burlington to do some Christmas shopping. But as uh, it, it started to, to storm up, uh, it was, I think I said already, but it was December 9th, so I'm sure it was already pretty cold and nasty. And as they tried to round the southern end of the breakwater in Burlington, their steering mechanism broke, and they were headed straight for the breakwater. So Captain Montgomery was able to deploy an anchor, stop the boat temporarily. They jury-rigged a new tiller onto the rudder post. And they cut the anchor loose, and, and as they tried to get around the end of the breakwater, they just didn't make it and ended up running into the breakwater itself. So now the waves are lifting this boat up and dropping it onto the breakwater. And as they did so, realizing that it was about to go down, with every time it hit the breakwater, one of them took the opportunity to jump off onto the breakwater. And you can see that very dramatically happening here in this uh, another Ernie Haas painting. So they had, and his, you know, Montgomery was the last to get off the boat, and as he did, the boat sank and went down. Um, and so they survived this shipwreck, but now they're in, <laughs> they're stuck on the breakwater in the middle of this tremendous storm. And apparently quite a, uh, quite a crowd had gathered on the shoreline to watch this drama happening, but nobody was brave enough to hop into a boat and go save them, except for this man up here, James Wakefield, who was an old salt, had spent many years as a mariner uh, you know, in saltwater situations and on Lake Champlain. He ran a, uh, a chandlery shop on the Burlington waterfront, so he sold sails and equipment for vessels. And if you're familiar with Burlington, that's where Shanty on the Shore is now. That was his shop. He grabbed his 14-year-old son, threw him into a a rowboat and they rowed out and rescued all these people from the breakwater. Um, and this is something we commemorate at the Maritime Museum now with our rowing program. We, we build rowing gigs for school groups to use and for physical education programs. And they have the James Wakefield Rescue Row every year where they do a big <laughs> row around and, and commemorate this exciting, hopefully it's not during a storm uh, and there's no, you know, no, no half frozen people to recover. but. Uh, Always an interesting story to tell. Um, that boat settled to the bottom. It was rediscovered in the 1980s, and it was actually one of the first times that, we, uh, that anybody had discovered this sailing canal boat unique thing that we, nobody had really known about before. Um, this is some of the previous documentation, but uh, recently I was able to produce another three-dimensional model of this wreck itself, and this is what it looks like today. You can see the two mast stubs. Those are actually called mast tabernacles, which is where the ma you, know, you would pull a pin out, open a hinge, and then you could fold the mast down. Whereas a traditional sailing ship, the mast would go all the way through the deck down into the bottom of the vessel and be mounted into the keel or keelson at the bottom of the vessel. So those are very distinguishing features of a sailing canal boat. Uh, you can still see the cargo of stone, cut stone blocks that is down in the hold. The, the family's... Um, 
you know, cast iron cook stove is still in the cabin. It's, it's a really neat wreck to dive. And it's only in about 40 feet of water. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's very accessible for, for almost all divers. Um, so steam technology. As I mentioned, uh, Lake Champlain was a very early adopter of steam technology, but that continued right up into the 1950s, right? The use of steam boats on Lake Champlain. And so there's ample evidence of sunken steamboats in Lake Champlain too. And probably my favorite story from the steamboat era is that of the Champlain II, which started its life as the Oaks Ames. The vessel that was built in the 1870s, actually as a railroad car ferry. At this point in time, there wasn't many crossings of the lake for railroad, uh, for railroad, for trains at all. So this boat was built to be able to carry uh, about a dozen railroad cars from one side of the lake to the other. Because there were, there were train tracks that ran down both sides of the lake that they just weren't interconnected at all. So this boat was, you know, it was basically just a big open space. It actually had two steam engines, one to power each paddle wheel, which made it extremely maneuverable, right? Kind of like a caterpillar tractor. It could basically spin around on the spot if it wanted to. Um, it operated in that capacity for a number of years until a couple of railroad uh, causeways were established that crossed the lake and it was no longer needed as a railroad ferry. So it was sold to the Lake Champlain Transportation Company who ran the passenger steamboats on the lake and they converted it into a very opulent steam vessel for their operation. Um, in July of 1875, it was under the command of this gentleman, Captain L. Rockwell, who was the longest serving steamboat captain on Lake Ch in Lake Champlain history. Started working on steamboats when he was 12. And I, I believe he was 92 when he finally retired and ultimately died. So, and I, I think he was driving the Ticonderoga. So he got to see you know, a, a long swath of, uh, of steamboat history on Lake Champlain. Um, the boat is leaving Westport, New York, headed north. Um, Captain L. Rockwell, uh, it's, it's around the middle of the night. He decides it's time for him to, uh, to have a rest. So he puts his, cap, his pilot, John Eldridge, in charge. Goes back, lays his head down on, on his pillow. And just a few minutes later, he just hears this terrible, rending, ship-destroying noise. And he comes running back up to the pilot house. And he finds the Champlain too. I mean, you didn't, this isn't just run aground. This is, this is really run aground. And, you know, he quickly springs into action, uh, makes sure that everybody gets off the boat, nobody's injured. Uh, he's able to save all their, uh, their cargo and their luggage. Um, in, in, during this whole hubbub, uh, Eldridge, the pilot, disappears off into the woods. <laughs> and... Uh, they don't find him for a few more days, and they come to find out that this guy was suffering from gout, and he was a laudanum addict. So he was high as a kite and either fell asleep or didn't realize what was happening and just drove this boat full steam up onto, uh, onto this uh, rocky point here. The boat was only insured against fire damage, so it was a complete loss. The uh, transportation company came in and actually recovered everything that they could out of it. You know, they rolled up the carpets, they took the steam engines out and actually put those into some other boats. They even took as much of the upper works away as they could and recycled that, um, that wood into other, uh, other projects. Some of the local folks that lived along the shoreline there did the same thing. They came down and harvested parts of it. There are a number of houses on the New York shore in this area that have components of the Champlain II built into them. And there is even, the pilot house was recovered by a family that lived in Charlotte at the time, who went in the winter of 1776. They went over there, removed the pilot house onto a sledge, dragged it on the ice all the way back to Charlotte, and that was their camp for a number of years, was the, the pilot house. And... Uh, the new owners of that plot of land have incorporated it into their house, and I got to go see it a few years ago. It's quite remarkable to see uh, intact. This, what's left of this wreck, which is really just the bottom of the boat, um, is now part of the, the underwater dive preserve system, which is a series of shipwrecks in Lake Champlain that you can visit uh, safely for divers. The General Butler that we talked about before is also part of that system. <laughs> 
you know, the canal era and the commercial era really, particularly the canal era, really came to an end with the continued expansion of the railroad network throughout the area. Uh, the canals continued to be expanded um, up until the creation of the New York State Barge Canal System in 1918. Um, but shipments of stuff really dropped off pretty dramatically in the late 19th century. Um, railroads can run year round. Obviously, the canal system closes in the winter. Um, it ends up being more efficient to use railroad for hauling a lot of bulk goods, and ultimately the, the canal trade dies off. The steamboat usage on Lake Champlain really died off with the construction of the Champlain Bridge in 1929. The bridge, ironically, was built with that huge arch in the middle to accommodate this vessel, the Vermont 3, which was the largest steamboat on Lake Champlain at the time. And pretty much as soon as the bridge opened, that boat shut down and <laughs> was... <laughs> Sent off. And right, so the rest of the 20th century, all we had was the Ticonderoga, which of course is now at the Shelburne Museum. And if you haven't seen it, you should definitely go. It's just a beautiful boat. And the, ha the fact that we still have it is quite remarkable. So that's really as, you know, when the commercial era started to wind down. We c did continue to have some commercial traffic through the Barge Canal. Um, uh, into the 1950s, 60s, and a lot of that was actually jet fuel that was coming through the barge canal to go up to the Plattsburgh Air Force Base. That was some of the last commodities to travel through the, the Champlain Valley. So that brings us to the recreational period of the lake's history. Obviously sailing, kayaking, <laughs> fishing, power boating, having a grand old time out there. And as I mentioned before, I'd like to think we're moving into the conservation era of the lake's history. Um, because we all realize what an absolute gem this lake is and its natural resources and cultural resources have so much still to tell us and so much to learn from um, as we work to, to preserve the lake and the things that are found within it. So that's my presentation today. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Kathy, anything from Zoom? Oh, hmm. Okay, the, coming the other direction, sir. Of course. Yeah. Let me see. No, here, you want to use this one? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, off of uh, Blanchard Beach, there's a... Uh, like a um, sort of a, a rig, you know, that, that mm. obviously they had taken um, fuel or oil off of yes. and back to the, the tanks in the back there. That's right. So uh, was that all part of the, the um, um, tugboat system at one point? It was, yes. Those are what's often referred to as oil dolphin. Um, and that's exactly right. That's where large fuel barges or oil barges would pull up and then they could pump from those dolphins up to the big tank farms on shore. And at one time, there was lots of those all along the Burlington waterfront and the point south. If you think about in the past, uh, Texaco, what's you know, commonly referred to now at the northern end of Burlington as Texaco Beach, it's called that because Texaco Oil had a huge tank farm there. And there were a number of those dolphins there that pumped up to there. And that's also how they transferred this jet fuel to this uh, to the Air Force Base in Plattsburgh was by using those dolphins. So these enormous fuel barges didn't have to get too close to shore. They could just pump while they were still out there safely. And that uh, those dolphins off of Oak Ledge, you know, they're the only ones left. The rest were removed in the early 2000s. Um, and it, it's still, a, it's a fun place to dive around because it's really shallow until you get out to those dolphins. And then, you know, when these barges were pushed up against the dolphin and they pumped them out, the tugboat sat there with its engine running to hold it in place. So there's this huge washout crater on the bottom of the lake and then everything from the surrounding area floats in there and you find all kinds of weird stuff down in there. Uh, but that's the deepest part of your dive is when you dive down into this little washout hole. Uh, okay, what else? Anybody else have questions? It's working. Hold on. Coming to you. We're microphone challenged. My friend and I were down um, by Perkins Pier, and 
three people of, from Japan or China came through. Two were journalists, one was a photographer. Okay. And they asked us if we had seen the lake monster. <laughs> oh. And I just wondered what progress has been made. A very relevant question. And you know, about every five or six years, a film crew, typically from Japan, comes and is looking for these, you know, crypto creatures or whatever they call them. Um, no sign of Champ yet that I've seen. I will, t I will tell one anecdote about Champ, and I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the myth of Champ. I don't know if I'm a believer in the reality of Champ, but it, anything's possible. It's a really dark, it's a really deep lake. Anything's possible. But my one, the one moment I was nervous about being in the water with Champ was uh, doing a night dive on a, a shipwreck very similar to the General Butler called the O.J. Walker. It's a little bit further out in, Bar in Burlington Harbor. We were doing a night dive, a whole group of us from Waterfront Diving Center. And as we came uh, back to the surface, right, this, this is uh, also a wreck that's in the preserve system. So it has this big buoy that you tie your boat off to and then you dive down to see the shipwreck. We, as we came up and did our safety stop, you, you tend to stop at about 15 feet below the water surface. You pause there for five minutes so you can off-gas some nitrogen and stuff from your dive. And we decided we'd all turn our lights off at that point. It was super creepy. Um, <laughs> everybody had also a glow stick hanging off the back of their tank just as a backup light. And we're just sitting there bobbing around. <laughs> I'm looking up and there's this big buoy above me. I'm like, Looks like a fishing bobber. And I'm like, a, I'm like the worm hanging out down here. <laughs> I was just waiting for, you know. I turned my light back on pretty quickly. <laughs> that, so. that, that's my only quasi-champ experience. How deep is the lake? The lake gets to 420 feet in its deepest flight, which is actually near Thompson's Point, actually. Uh, the average depth of the lake is 70-ish feet. So, you know, there's a really deep channel down the center of the lake. Of course, south of the, uh, of the Champlain Bridge, it barely gets above 20 feet in depth. The Inland Sea uh, up near St. Albans, also quite shallow, you know, maybe 50 feet deep. So it's the, the number's really skewed by that very deep trench uh, down the center of the lake. So perfect place for champ to hang out <laughs> and, and breed new generations of champs. Anyone Any else? other questions? Anyone else? Okay, Someone I've got here. one coming. Hold on. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I went in the, on your website uh, a couple days ago when I heard you were going to come here, and yeah. I went and did some, you know, see what y'all were doing. Sure. And there is some a lot of reference to some um, uh, uh, steamboat uh, disasters where a lot of uh, boiler explosions, and there was like I counted in the in the references in the newspaper counts and everything, there's probably about seven different steamboats just spontaneously exploded. Do you, do you have any uh, stat, uh, stats on how many of those boat disasters there were? I, I don't, and the majority of those, when you hear about steam or boiler explosions, that was typically on the Western River steamboats, which had, you know, the the, the steamboats that are operated on the Ohio and the Mississippi River systems, um, they had to be extremely shallow vessels. So they tried to build them as lightly as possible. And that included the machinery. Oh. So the machinery in that case was a high pressure system that they could build relatively small but had enough force to make the boat go pretty fast. Um, and that led to the possibility of these kind of boiler explosion, which apparently were just absolutely horrendous because, right, you know, suddenly this, the worst disaster, I think it was a vessel called the Westfield that was carrying a bunch of Union troops after the war. It ex had, I think, 400 Union soldiers on board. And then, you know, a huge percent of them were scalded to death by this boiler explosion. On Lake Champlain, w with the side wheel paddle wheelers that we had, uh, they were actually a low pressure system. Uh, engine system mostly so boiler explosions weren't a huge problem on lake champlain okay. um, the majority of the wrecks here of steamboats were uh, we did have one st 
Steamboat Fire, the Phoenix in 1819. That's another vessel that's in the dive preserve system sunk up on Colchester Shoal. The other wrecks that we have are almost uh, all wrecks that were abandoned, you know, were sunk on purpose because their use life was complete and they were just pushed up and sunk. One other question is okay. uh, the, the Ticonderoga was put in dry dock here in the 50s. Yes. And uh, there's a sister ship that, that when I came up here and found out about that, it was still operating somewhere in another Great Lake area. It was a sister ship to the Ticonderoga, and it was into the 70s it was still taking yes. trips. I think that's, you might be thinking of the Mount Washington that was over on Lake Winnipesaukee in right. New Hampshire. Um, yeah, and you know, you can still go down and take a steamboat ride on Lake George, uh, but those are modern reconstructions of these, of these There steamboats. was never any efforts to keep the Ticonderoga alive? I just think it wasn't financially viable anymore. You know, at this point, the passenger service was dead. It was really only used for excursions, um, which it apparently did a fair number of, but I think it had just uh, become financially unfeasible. And luckily, Electra Havemeyer Webb stepped in to save the boat, which is something that could never happen <laughs> in today's day and age. The amount of effort and work and expense that it went to, right, making a dry dock, building a railroad bed, letting that boat settle, you know, draining the dry dock and letting that boat settle onto a cradle that can, can be then dragged over land where it sits today. It's, un, it's unbelievable. Um, and if you do get to go see the Ticonderoga at the Shelburne Museum, they have wonderful videos of that whole operation that I watch every time I'm there. I'm also very impressed with how fast that boat was. You see it moving down the lake in those videos, and it's got this big walking beam engine right on top. It's a single cylinder. The cylinder is three feet in diameter. I think. You'd climb down inside of it if you had to. So it's just going dunk, dunk, dunk. But the boat's going, you know, probably 20 knots. It's really cruising along. So very impressive uh, piece of machinery in, in the Ticonderoga. Glad we still have it. Chris, this has been terrific. Thank you so, so Thank much. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it.